Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Cannon, and today I'm here with Benjamin Lieber. Ben is a creative director, visual artist, and a musician. He has this great group, Marigold. He used to be in this band, Head North, who both of his groups always have this like really just cinematic quality to their music, like their songs would weave into one another. I'd be mastering these records and be like so funny, like people would write me and say, I want my songs to weave together the way theirs do. And I'm like, uh, you have to actually make parts that weave together. Mastering doesn't do that. Anyway, let's talk about Ben. So you'll hear in this, part of why I wanted to talk to him is everywhere I look, I always see him getting tagged, just doing awesome work. Then when I look at it, I'm like, this looks awesome. I'll have mastered a song. I'll see he did the artwork. He'll make a video for some band. I see somebody else saying how good it is. So I'm like, I should talk to him. I kind of know this person and I should get to know him better since that's what we do here. But anyway, he's done all this great work and I want you to either before this starts or after it's done, zoom around his work. In the description, I have videos for a bunch of bands. He's done work with like Seaway, Bearings, Barely Civil, The Blue Chips. He's done great, great, great work. So go to his website, which is benjaminlieber.net, which is also linked down below. Click around, take in what he's doing. He's got lots of advice on if you can't afford him, how you do this yourself. And I think he delves into a lot of interesting things on how to make great content in this video. So I hope you check it out. Enjoy. So super psyched to have you. Uh, we've known each other because I've mastered some projects for you and then I've always stayed in touch. But the funny thing that I, and the reason I want to talk to you is I feel like I keep looking on social media and whenever I see something looking cool and I'm like, oh, wow, that's great art. Oh, that video is great. I'm like, what the fuck? How are you doing all this? These are so many different things. So I wanted to have you on to talk today about how you're doing all these cool things. Starting off with a very big compliment. Yeah, so, doing which great. Always, yeah. Which, which <laughs> all, 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 always leads to a big blush. But uh, right. so right. tell us how you got here to doing what you're doing today. Well, like you said in the beginning, um, kind of started in music. You mastered some records for my old band, Head North, which was, uh, you know, out of high school and then five, six years out of high school. Um, my main thing, playing in that band, touring around the country and, uh, you know, making connections that way in the music industry. That kind of slowed down a little bit in like 2016, 2017. Um, I moved to New York and didn't really know what I wanted to do yet, but obviously like music was just this thing that had started in my life and it was kind of never going to stop. So once I figured out that I kind of had a knack for photography and image creation in general, um, I just kind of started pursuing that and, you know, tied the two together, um, just started reaching out to my friends in music and asking for them to let me take their picture. Yeah, I don't know. It just kind of snowballed from there. It went really well. And I think that because I had like that supportive network set up already, it just allowed me for like every project to really like expand my brain and, and keep learning and growing. And it's funny looking back at like my first few works, like I, I can see myself learning and, and growing exponentially with every project. So I attribute it all to the network that I created when I started just playing in a band, really. And it is that funny thing because like so many people like one get nervous. Like I actually do this um one podcast that I produce called Killed by Desk and it's all about people's career after they've been in a band and like mm. what they move into. And it's like the most common thing people talk about is is like, well, I toured with these people and then this person gave me this connection, this person gave me that. I'm like, yeah, punk rock and indie, the indie world and the underground world is the greatest networking thing of all time. Totally. This episode right now is a great yep. example, you know, like what, the first product project we worked on together was probably 2014 or something like that. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah. You know, that's it's just a great example of like it never really goes away. It's, it's yep. cool. So working on other people's like obviously you worked on your own music and you, I imagine you'd have some people eerie with you. What considerations do you give when you're working with another artist? And talk to me about like how you figure out what you're going to do with another artist when you work with them. Yeah, I mean, I like to keep it about the music as much as possible. I think that, like, because I do both and, like, have a brain that can uh, understand both, I have, like, a unique perspective when it comes to what a band wants to be represented like visually. 
Um, I, I don't know. I, I think a lot of the times artists know what they want and they see it in their head, but they don't know how to like articulate it because they're good at playing music. They're not good at, you know, like that's okay. Yeah. And that's how most people should be. So I think that because I've somehow like developed skills in both arenas, um, I can bridge that gap for people. And so, yeah, usually it starts with the music for me. I mean, it has to come back to that at least. Um, but oftentimes artists have like a ton of inspiration that drive the, at least that record that they're working on or, or the band as a whole, where they say, this is, you know, this is what inspires us. And right off the bat, you know, there's always something that you can pull from, from looking at inspiration. Um, obviously a lot of my work is inspired by like older grungy shit. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I just look at stuff that I think is cool. And I'm like, that's a really cool idea. I'm going to try and like do that in my own way. And I, I try to make it as much of a collaborative process as possible. Obviously, like I don't really enjoy the kind of like gatekeepy some designers and visual artists are like i'm gonna do my thing you're not a part of it like yeah. take it or leave it and i don't really understand that because you wouldn't have a project if it weren't for the band's records so like it has to kind of like circle around that you know mm -hmm. yeah so collaboration is big for me too so let's talk a little bit more about this cover so, so like one of the things that i was really taken by was uh you sent me over some stuff that you've done with this band seaway and so <laughs> I'm remembering right, and I I feel like I should have fact checked this before we taped, but like Seaway was a much more pop punky band previously. Totally. And yeah, I mean, Head North toured with them and Knuckle Puck in 2015. You know, we all were pop punk bands at that point. So yeah, you guys it, were a little. I wouldn't put it as pop punk. Whatever it was, is what it is. I, but, adjacent, adjacent. Yeah, adjacent. Um, yeah, they, they have like transformed their sound. And um, that's another example of like, you know, I did that tour with them. We just stayed friends. And many, many years later, through years of both of our growths as artists and people, we kind of came together again at this point of like, this makes sense right now because our lines have like yeah. met there. So what does collaboration look like with that? Like, I imagine like, you know, like there's like a funny thing of like kids will get so like, They'll think there's this nefarious thing, but it's like, obviously they're positioning themselves as not looking like a bunch of idiots in hoodies and uh, that were that band that toured with Knuckle Puck. So what, what are some of the thoughts that go into like, what were some of your considerations when you guys were making all these like really cool visuals? Totally. Yeah. I mean, they kind of came to me with the record. I don't know if you've listened to it at all, but I it's like wildly different, you know? Yes. Um, I think it's amazing. And yeah. I, I call it like a post-1975 pop punk now, you know. Yeah, if I say that to somebody like, who doesn't know, they think it's the year, but I'm like, no, 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 the band. Yeah. Every song just like is so catchy. Like even if you don't actively go to listen to like pop-oriented music, there's no way that you can't like bite onto those hooks that they mm -hmm. write. Um, so they came to me with this record and it had, you know, it was just, it was just different, like had a lot of like, heavier guitar and but also like radio pop melodies and it was just like weird music that was totally different than anything they did and they basically said to me like we don't want to do anything that we have done before like we want to change everything we want to look different we want the vibe to be completely opposite and started throwing some inspiration at me a big inspiration was like ziggy stardust david bowie we were looking at a lot of like cyber human stuff like that kind of 90s future references space odyssey kind of stuff yeah we were just like really looking for stuff that was like weird like cool but like not necessarily right off the bat like giving you a direction or an energy just something that was like weird and uh i don't know we kind of I, I started coming up with this idea of like a hairless featureless almost robotic human like perfect human kind of look mm -hmm. and uh then i teamed up with a friend of mine who does like fx makeup we found this model Really, I didn't have like the whole idea fleshed out in my head when I went to like shoot it. I just wanted to get like a good base and then just experiment in mm -hmm. Photoshop. And, and that's what happened. You know, I just came up with some crazy stuff in in post with uh, some great photographs to start. 
Yeah, and it is that funny thing because we all want to be like, oh, I conceived everything from the start, but like, right. never there happens. is so <laughs> much. Yeah, there, there's so much magic. I mean, I particularly, you know, it's like so funny. I'm so old into making music. Like, I've been making music for three decades, and <sighs> but now that I've been like playing with cameras and lighting for the first time, it's like I experiment like a kid again, and I see how much that helps, and I've gained this like huge sympathy for the bands in the studio because I'm like, wait, they're yeah. doing that exploration thing, whereas I always know exactly what I want to do and I know to grab that pedal and just do it because it's in my mm -hmm. head automatically, but right. none of the visual stuff's ever in my head because I don't have a vision yet. Totally. That's like the biggest thing for me is like not, you don't have to know everything to like find good creativity. Um, I, there's such a, there's a specific beauty in, like just wandering around in the dark and finding something mm -hmm. spontaneously. Like, yeah, I, I think that's huge. And eventually, you know, 10 years from now in me just doing that, I will obviously like know more and learn more than I do right now. And that will change how I approach certain things, of course. But I think that as long as you're continuing to like in whatever the next pursuit is, like stumble around in the dark a little bit, I think is really important i like that so the other th one of the other things you sent me was this video that was a diorama video for a group called barely civil that was really really cool and so i i watched that and it's like the funny thing of that i can see obviously i hate when people are like oh i put no imprint on anything it's like i can see a through line of like your color palette in that from mm. some of the other th stuff i watched but so when you're developing that, how does that happen with that group of like, because that seems like that was a lot of you compared to like <laughs> a collaboration, whereas I see with the Seaway thing, a ton of collaboration and like yeah. them putting their own look on things. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Totally. Yeah, the Barely Civil video is like the band and the label came to me. Really, literally all they gave me was we're looking to do, this was like in March or April, like right when shit started to hit the fan. They're like, we need a music video done remotely, I think was how they put it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's like very ambiguous, but like, <laughs> let me see what, how I can spin that. And uh, there's, um, have you seen the movie Dinner for Schmucks? I have seen that movie. Yeah. That, that's okay. a fun movie. So in like, there's like the intro title sequence before the movie starts is like this camera, my, like macro camera pan over this like whole diorama set that mm -hmm. um, Steve Carell builds out of like the mouse people and stuff. Yes. And I always thought it was so cool. Um, and I've kind of like kept it in the back of my head. I used to build dioramas with my dad when I was a kid for like Boy Scouts and stuff. And um, I don't know, I just kind of always had that, that scene in the back of my head. And when they mentioned like a remote music video, I, was, I just thought of it. And then the like concept for the storyline was built from the song and like the lyrics, you know, it's, it's kind of like a COVID mantra for sure. Like people just kind of ruining the earth and burns you to the ground. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but the, that nice light, light thoughts. Yeah. Nice light thoughts. Um, so yeah, it just kind of like developed that way. And then uh, I actually, because I was staying with my parents at the time because of coronavirus i ended up doing that project with my dad like the whole oh, way wow. through like we built it we planned it we did all the scenes together and uh it was a really nice like collaborative experience that's fucking rad um Thanks. yeah it's really i mean and i should say every video that we're discussing this will all be linked below for people to watch but i imagine so that's a nice wide berth. So I imagine that's coming from you getting inspired from things. Is there anything you've been like really watching that is lately that you've been like, wow, I really want to make this. And like, how does mm -hmm. that come into being in your work? Mm -hmm. Do you like keep track of that stuff? Do you do, do anything like that? Kind of. I think it, it happens in tandem. Like I will mm -hmm. see something that inspires me. And then maybe a week later, a band will hit me up, but won't have an idea. And I'll just be like, uh, <laughs> like pull it over right into there or vice versa. You know, I'll, a band will hit me up. I won't know what to do. And then I'll stumble upon something and it'll give me an idea. I, a lot of ideas that I've been like personally 
uh, holding on to the past like four or five months um, have been put into uh, stuff for my band, Marigold. I'm working on a new record. We just shot a bunch of music videos for it that I like creatively directed. And they're all kind of like, it's kind of like becoming my my big baby. So yeah, I, a lot of ideas have been shot into that. But yeah, I don't know. I just kind of like find it and then find a way to apply it. Nice. Yeah, I definitely want to get into how you've been doing that with that record. But so one thing I'm going to get into before that is that so you also, and this was one of the impetus for the conversation, is I think like first I saw some art you did for a group called Pollyanna that I mastered. Mm -hmm. And then I saw this blue chip stuff on your Instagram. And so you're also building more than just the video. You're also building like stories and other thing assets for the group. Tell me how you talk a group through with that whole look thing and how you talk about the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. you, you're referring to like the actual conceptual story. Yeah, well, as you that? said, I, I, if I recall, you also made some Instagram story art for them and stuff like that yeah. too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, I see. You're talking about like the yeah. assets. Um, yeah. Uh, like, so everything that comes along with that, what does that look like now? Cause like, I think about like 10 years ago when I was managing bands, like I wouldn't have to say to the director, <laughs> get me anything aside from something I could put on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, there's definitely like so much more to consider now. And sometimes it's a the headache, but I try to look at it in a uh, positive light in that, like, there's just, 10 more ways that you can like expand the one idea that you have even like i don't know how recent if it was yesterday or recently like spotify just gave all artists access to yes, the canvas which is yeah last week huge, yeah. you know so i'm gonna be freaking busy as hell <laughs> uh, yeah i don't know i like to as i do this stuff more and more i i experience what works what doesn't work when when trying to expand ideas to fit those different subcategories of, of what you need. I think that every time I do it, I take mental notes of like what works, what doesn't work. And when coming up with the main idea for the next project, you structure it in a way that is slightly open-ended and can allow you to take it in different directions. The Seaway Project is a huge example of that. You know, I didn't go into the photo shoot thinking this is what it's going to be. It's only going to be this, you know, I created something that was flexible so that when literally like eight months later, I needed to make all these different pieces of content for YouTube or Instagram or whatever, it was there, you know, and, and there was still like meat to be picked off the bone in a way. I like that. Yeah. So you have this upcoming record with Marigold. This is your third or fourth record for your this will be the third, third record. Yeah. Nice. So tell us about that and how, and what has changed in the group? Yeah. So, um, up until now, Marigold has just kind of been like my solo project that I started when Head North started to chill out. And it was just like, well, oh, I'll do this to like write some songs and I won't really like invest too much in it. Um, that kind of has like not sufficed for me the past year or two. I was stupid busy all of last year getting visual art business like off the ground and I was, I was really only focusing on that and I was living in New York and like just non-stop moving all the time had no time to write music whatsoever and this year that you know towards the end of last year I felt that like absence of writing music and I also at the same time felt really stale in just my songwriting like within myself i felt like i kept writing the same thing i was just playing the g chord for 20 minutes and didn't know what to do anymore so i didn't i i decided that i didn't want it to be a, a just me thing anymore so long story short i got a band and marigold is a band now i met the rest of the band through touring the past couple of years just various connections and it really like would not have become the thing that it has been if not for COVID. March and April hit and all of a sudden I had so much time on my hands and so I just wrote a record and uh, feel really good about it and we basically wrote it together remotely like we just sent shit back and forth to each other. And so you then, guys are talking uh, like literally like lay it down to a click Dropbox back and forth? Yeah, 
Yeah. Like I would, you know, I'd have initial ideas. I would like make it some sort of structure to like fake drums in garage band. And then I would send them all the stems and they would, you know, make, he would make his drum track and then bass track and we'd put them together and see what didn't work and then redo it a million times. And, you know, it was definitely like the weirdest writing process I've ever experienced, but it was, had to happen that way. And like, yeah. I don't know, it, it all worked out and, and I'm so proud of what we created. It's easily like the best music I've ever written. And it's because of like the collaboration. I, I've really learned that a lot this year is that collaboration is like so, so important. So yeah, we recorded it finally end of September with Eric Romero. Awesome guy. Yeah, I've worked with, I've worked with him on some uh, Kevin Divide stuff. Yeah. He's great. Nice. He's so talented. It was a blast. He's like one of the most creative people I've ever met. And yeah, we just, we created a fucking awesome record. So now, yeah, it's like in the mixing and mastering process. And uh, we just like two weeks, weekends ago, had a big weekend. We filmed three music videos and I like creative, really creatively directed all of them. So that's really, really exciting. These videos are kind of like the uh, cross point of like all my things so they're they're definitely very close to me and i'm very proud of them so, so when you say that the cross point of all your things to tell me about what that looks like <laughs> it's basically like write record a, an entire album and then do the other side of things of like having the visual idea directing a project executing all of it but also like being in the band so yeah it was yeah. it was stressful yeah um, yeah <laughs> But I had a ton of help. We had a great team together. And that was the other thing too, was like, I went into it saying, I want to hire my friends. I have so many talented friends. This is going to be a collaborative project. I'm not going to do everything. So that was like, having that approach from the start was really, really important. So obviously you get to be a little objective when you work with other groups. How do you maintain your objectivity through doing this? Yeah, uh, definitely. Like I know what I want. There's a lot of like conceptualism to this record that we've created. There's specific imagery, there's specific color palettes. You know, I, I really, from start to finish have kind of like, I didn't want to just create like Marigold 3. Like I, it, it, it's definitely a specific thing. And uh, I would like to think that like what the ideas that we've created are cool enough that like anyone that wants to work on it is like down to just further that idea. That's really how I like to put it. Because I think that it, it, it's important to like see it through and execute it correctly. And uh, collaboration to do that can be really valuable. So yeah, that's kind of like how I put it. Like the idea is important. Help me do it. Gotcha. Yeah. That's rad. What do we see on the horizon for when, when people will be seeing this? Who knows, man? I mean, it's <laughs> we're kind of coming to like a weird time in the year. Uh, just yeah. regarding to like music industry in general. As I joke, uh, last week was the last week anybody got anything gets anything done till uh, end of January. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of trying not to like stress myself out about it. We're like we literally are still like in the mix revision process. So mm -hmm. there's a lot to come still. And because the, the year is kind of getting to this point, I'm almost in the headspace of like attack it fresh in the new year, and you'll just be better it'll feel better yeah try not to rush it it's the coolest thing i've ever done so i'm trying to just let it take its time <laughs> i like that so when you're creating all this stuff like we always say like you know it's like we're creating to see the things we want to see in the world mm -hmm. now is there stuff you'd want bands to reach out you to, to you to make in this world today anything like that mm -hmm. come to mind i would love to like i don't know this is this is a bit um philanthropic but i would love to do more visual art that is like conceptual and based around like more powerful meaningful messages if that makes sense like i'm down always down i will always be down to like just make cool shit for making cool shit sake and i love just like making a band look cool that's awesome to me but i would like to test myself on creating something that has has a more powerful message um and i don't know what that you know specifically may be or not but like i think trying to like reach deeper while not sacrificing the like aesthetic thing that i've done well with like honing in on that's an interesting challenge to me yeah no i you know it's like the funniest thing I, like i always say to people especially people who like to mean pop music i'm like well to me 
making groundbreaking pop music, nothing harder. Because if you're finding how to do something interesting while maintaining a hook, you're doing the two hardest challenges. But then if you add in the third thing of actual, like, meaning and message with that, that's the hardest fucking thing to do. Like, no one pretty much can balance that act. Like, it's the rarest thing that's ever occurred, so. Right. Yeah, that's uh, those that's those forever songs where it, it, someone could put it out today and it would still pop off, you know. Yeah, and I, I so I totally always get that because I'm like, and it's a funny thing of like we all strive for, but it's so easy to be just in such bad taste when you do things that have overt meaning and are not buried in metaphor. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that you got to start on one end, right? You got to like know how to make things be appealing, whether that's sonically or visually or whatever. And once you like get that as like second nature for yourself, then it's like, okay, start reaching deeper, but always come back to that. Always come back to that. How far can you go while still coming back to that place? I think is really important. I like that. So let's talk a little bit more about like actual bullshit of getting this done. So what you do is notoriously, and I should say, what you do with the many things you do, music videos, is notoriously a no money making game. <laughs> Yet you're making great looking work. I know the labels and bands you're working with. They are not throwing you a bajillion dollars. <laughs> How do you work to make this all like what, what goes into your work to get these great results? Because I, I, I should also say it's like that's the hardest thing that I think people underestimate about video directors when they haven't done work to the level you do it. It's like it takes fucking miracles to get work that looks that great done on yeah. the budgets you're getting handed. So totally. Yeah. I mean, it's always, it's always a squeeze, no matter what, like, it's just like a balancing act of knowing your worth, but also understanding the world that you operate in. And, you know, there's this added element of like, I'm really just passionate about making stuff. And like, do I really care about the money? But like, I also need to make money. And it's just a balancing act of all those thoughts. And I think as I just work more and do more projects, I also, you know, as I build more and more of a portfolio for myself, I definitely feel stronger and stronger in the, this is what I'm worth kind of space. Frankly, like, I don't agree that there should be this, like, I don't I keep saying the word gatekeepy, but like, I don't, I don't understand why it can't be like transparent, like why there has to be this like tiered hierarchy to content creators and artists and yes. whatever. Like we're all just like making stuff. I'll, I'm going to be, completely upfront about like what I need to make to survive. You know, Mm -hmm. I have X bills and and that's that. So like, and, and X time, you know, that I only have so much time. So where it's like, you know, I can crunch and push, but like, I think being realistic with yourself, realistic with your client saying, if they're asking too much for too little of you, just being realistic and say like, I literally don't have that much time for yeah. for this, you know? So yeah, I think like knowing your worth is like really what it comes down to. Just like, you know, I've worked my ass off the past two and a half years making all this cool shit. And like, to me, that puts me at a point now where I can like have a little more standing ground and mm-hmm. say like, these are the things that I've proven that I can execute well. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. No, it totally makes sense. So how about like equipment buying? Like, what are you investing in? What do you, where do you buy into yourself with all this stuff? It's a good or, question. Uh, or is it re- rentals? Like, what does that look like for somebody? Well, I mean, up until now, it's definitely been a lot of investing in my own stuff. I, like my desktop setup was a big purchase. I got a 27 inch iMac, 5k retina. It's oh, great. Yeah. It's a workhorse. My next thing will probably be upgrading the RAM, but yeah, like I've gotten myself to a point now where like I have the editing gear, I have, you know, basic photo and video gear. I have a video camera, I got a couple digital SLRs and I have like a film camera collection that I love and rely on. I'm starting to find myself in a point now where I feel like I have my bases covered and it's kind of coming in tandem with me. Um, a goal of mine shifting into next year is to move away from like the do a million roles in one project person and shifting more into like, like I said, the collaboration, like hiring out, 
working with a DP, working with, you know, a stylist, not doing everything for every project. And with that comes, you know, I don't want to like feel the need to buy all this new gear for every project and then own it and not make any profit, you know? So I'm trying to like, but I had to, I had to buy all the shit that I, that I've had to, you know, you have to invest at the start, but I do feel myself starting to shift into a place of um, renting when I need to rent, hiring out more often and just trying to make it less of like a continuous investment and more of like job comes in, here's the cost, here's the profit. Jobs comes in, here's the cost, here's the profit. Yeah. That's a point. It's like a funny thing because that is another thing that like I think people don't always consider in the life of it. It's like, you know, like kids will always say to me like, oh my God, what equipment would you buy right now? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I like I kind of own everything I need because I've right. been buying equipment since I was 15 and I'm 40 fucking two years old. Like right. I have 27 years of equipment I have to move in a few weeks. It's not right. fun. And exactly. there is that thing of like, and now, especially like with how much you can do in one or two boxes, it's like, it's not as much a thing, but you do need baseline before you can hit that point where you're like, okay, this one, I'm not going to have to spend all my money Totally. Investing into the business. So, but so you're doing a bunch of different creative formats though, too. So like, you know, if you're doing a video and I'm even saying in video wise, you have dioramas, you have yeah. these <laughs> videos with Seaway where you're like filming in an in industrial area. I imagine that takes, and I'm more just saying this as a question of somebody who only started learning video in the last year. Mm-hmm. That's got to take a wide span of stuff or is it really just knowing a lot of your tools? Uh, it's both. I mean, the Seaway projects, for example, were a massive collaboration. Like I pretty much just handled everything in post. The Those videos were directed by Miguel Barbosa. He goes by Yeah, yeah Films out of uh, Vancouver. He's worked with Seaway on all their music videos their entire career. He directed everything and then he hired a DP, Christoph Benfi, in uh, Toronto to film the whole thing. So, you know, there was many levels of like, hiring out Ben to edit, uh, hiring out the DP to light and film the entire thing, using his lighting, using him, his cameras, et cetera. You know? So while like I did have a part in that, I, mm-hmm. I wouldn't, you know, I didn't yeah. handle like everything. So that's, that's an example of like, we have this massive idea. How can we make it, make it happen rather than like, Hey Ben, we have this massive idea. We want you to film and edit and do And you know, <laughs> exactly. So coming all the way other, on the other side to like the diorama stuff, I'm a huge fan of like DIY and like making stuff work with what you have, you know, that, that set and all of that stuff that I built for that video could have been way more legit. I could have had, I mean, I literally had like, you know, Home Depot can lights and like, it, you know, it was not like legit at all, but it, it worked. And Looks great. I think that I just often am like, especially cause it, you know, when a band comes to you and they're like, we got 400 bucks, we need a music video. And it's like, uh, well, there's, there's limitations to that, but sometimes most of the time, I think limitations can spur creativity because you're like confined in a yes. you know, way to make it work. And I just naturally like gravitate that way of like, this is more tangible. It's more realistic. It's easier. It's less overhead. Let's just do it this way. And I, yeah, I don't know. I think limiting yourself a little bit helps you be more creative and, and make it cooler in the end. Like just, just get started and then you find it in the computer and be like, holy shit, you know, I could just do this to it and it looks like totally different. Yeah, it's, it's always a funny thing that I joke about is like um, when you're telling somebody who hasn't realized that limitations are the greatest thing ever, they look at you with a look of just you are the biggest fucking idiot I've ever yeah. seen. And then they yeah. get there and they're like, oh, I should have listened to that person. Right. <laughs> totally. So with, with that, you're talking a lot about DIY stuff. So for the musician who's just getting into this is looking at your work and saying, wow, this is amazing. Or the kid who wants to be you when they see your stuff, where do they start with? Where do they grab? What, what's some great DIY early cheap stuff that they should start learning and start grabbing? I would get like a $200 Canon 5D Mark II. They're great cameras. They still work. And, you know, whatever lens you your eye looks for, And, uh, I would get, honestly, I love one of my favorite tools is a flatbed scanner. 
I use it all the time. So explain that. I'm very curious about this. Yeah. Um, I mean, the model is Epson Perfection V5- V550 photo. It's, so it's like technically a photo scanner. Um, but it's basically just flatbed scanner has glass on two sides, so it can scan negatives, but it also has like a flatbed. So it only is lighting the one side, you know, I don't know. It's, it's basically to me, it's a way to make anything that is in real life digital. Like you literally just put it on there, you press scan, and then it's on your computer. So, ha, huh, okay. I, I see what you mean now. That's kind of the way I look at it. Yeah. It's really I, I was, cool. I was thinking different, like. Do you ever look at like old Ray Gun magazines? You ever see that no, stuff? I'm not sure what you're talking about. I'll send this to you when we're done. So Ray Gun was this magazine that was like the design magazine in the early 90s. And all of their work, though, was like getting glitches from overly Xeroxing and scanning things mm. fucking badly. It's fucking awesome. It's some of my favorite design of all time. I'll, se- I'll se- send you some things, but if you do some Googling, it's incredible stuff that I think like so few people look at and take from. Anyway. Right. Back to your tools. <laughs> yeah. Flatbed scanner is huge. I love that. I would invest in a Apple product computer of sorts. It doesn't have to be an iMac. The MacBook Pros now are pretty sick. $1,900 um, for a fully loaded MacBook Pro. That's yeah. literally two times faster than any computer they made two years ago. Right. If you're getting getting started, if I pick one thing to buy, it'd be the newest MacBook Pro. Just yeah, to, yeah it's, it's I, really I, I, dope. Strong strong agree. Unless you want a big monitor and then buy the Mac Mini, since it's just as fast. Right, right. That's really it for me. Um, I, I really firmly believe that like creativity working in a Apple based system is like light years more productive and creative. That's just me, but I just think that the interface is very friendly to the creative brain. So learning, uh, I guess my fourth tool would be uh, Adobe, like get Adobe and just start learning Photoshop, learning Premiere. Those, I know that it's like, it's kind of a ridiculously expensive monthly fee. It's like $60 or something. I hate it, but I don't even bat an eye. I don't even think about it anymore because I literally use it for like 10 hours every single day of my life. So yeah, that's what everybody says to me about all my pro tools and plugin subscriptions. Exactly. They're like, why are you paying? I'm like, this is what I do to be creative. I don't know. This, yeah. it's, it's just, it's the thing I have to do. Right. It is what it is. Yeah. I mean, hard drive storage organization is like super important. I'm sure you deal with that too. But that's something, you know, you can get into once you find yourself having more than two terabytes worth of shit to put somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. A camera, scanner, a good computer, and Pinterest. Oh, really? Tell tell me about about that. Pinterest is like the the coolest tool for like finding ideas. It's okay, so, what so you're Instagram the o- should be. You're the only person I've ever heard talk about Pinterest who's not a 40-year-old mob redecorating their house. Oh, so, no. so I want you to tell me, though, no, because I trust that if you're saying this, it's got to be good. So explain to me what you're using Pinterest for. Just idea finding. Like it's the most intuitive social media I've ever found. It's what Instagram should be, in my opinion. Like once it takes a little bit for it to like start understanding what you like and what you look for. But once you get in there and you like start making a couple, I don't know what they call them, like boards, boards, yeah, mood, boards. mood boards or whatever. And it starts to like learn what you gravitate towards. It's just insane. Like how far down a rabbit hole of like creativity you could go just by looking at inspiration images. There has never ever been a project where like I have not had an idea right off the bat for something. And then I go on Pinterest and within like 10 minutes, I immediately have like 10 ideas. Um, Yeah. I just think it's like the most helpful tool to like finding ideas and, and like hashing out how something could look in your head. That's really interesting. So now I'm going to have to go down this road just like I had to be a uh, 40-year-old man and learn TikTok recently. So um, <laughs> I refuse to do that. So You know, I, I did. And now I'm like, because I found like all like political and cooking things. And now I'm like, mm. oh, this is great for five minutes a night. So one last thing. So th- this was an observation. Your music always sounds highly analog ma- manipulated. It sound, you have very good color in it is what I'd like to say, like very nice analog color. And then as well, you get these really analog tones, but you're talking so much about how much time you spend in the computer. Hmm. Interesting. 
Talk to me about yeah, that dichotomy. Totally. I mean, I I'm definitely heavily, if not mostly, inspired by the analog way, if you will. Um, retro, vintage shit, 50s all the way to the 90s. Things that look real, methods that are real. I, I love everything that is real. But the reality is we live in a digital world and um, that's what the jobs are. And I think what drives my creative brain the most is like, you see a idea in real life here and then it has to come all the way over here to be digital. How do you do that? Like what ways, and that's the flatbed scanner is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. Like um, using that to create paper textures that you then lay in Photoshop or using your digital camera to take a picture of something that is old and decrepit in real life that then becomes something in Photoshop. Like that's why I think getting Adobe right off the bat and like understanding how those programs work so that when you like see something in real life, your brain can just immediately run through all the channels of like, this is what I'll do, then this is what I'll do, then this is what I'll do. So that could become that basically. Okay. Yeah, I just, I, I like the, the transition is what interests figuring out. Like for example, I just made a font for the first really? time. Oh, wow. Last that's, so, night. that's awesome. Thank you. Um, it was really fun. Basically, it's for uh, Marigold, the new record. I wanted to create like a custom font for it. And basically, I like had a friend uh, make a stencil of every letter, capital, lowercase, blah, 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 and hand paint it onto like a canvas. And then we scanned the canvas into a, uh, the computer on the flatbed and I cut out all the background. And then like through a bunch of weaving, like inputted it into a font generator and like created a typeface out of it. So Damn. like, that's a great example of like, we want it to look like it's hand painted lettering, but I want to be able to type it whenever I want, however I want, whatever size. So that's that right there. I mean, it, it was, it took a lot, but it worked. <laughs> yeah. And then you have that for your entire campaign and your creative pursuits. Yeah. And that's fucking awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah, that's the idea. Well, I really look forward to seeing all this stuff. Why don't to wrap up, you tell everybody where they can find you and do a little self-promotion of some things that they can look for you on and all that fun stuff that all of us get embarrassed to do. Totally. I'm on all social media at Benjamin M. Lieber. Um, my website is firstandlastname.net. And I don't know what else is there. Marigold is my music project, Marigold NY. Um, and it's on Spotify. So that's and it. all of that will be linked below in the description of both this podcast and video. So Ben, oh, yeah. thank you so much for doing this. It was so fun chatting. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this podcast, there's tons more like this that are about to come up on the end screen, or you can click a link in the description below to see more like it. As well, if you want to hear more like this in your favorite podcast app, just search Noise Creators and all of my podcasts are in that feed there. As well, if you're a musician who's trying to go from 0 to 10,000 fans, I have a playlist linked below or on the screen in a second that's all about how you do just that, where I have tons and tons of videos on how you grow your fan base as a musician who hasn't yet established themselves. So please click that subscribe button and get notified to all my videos and stay tuned for even more content just like this. Thanks so much for watching.